Here I've got a nice equation involving the floor function, which is one of my favorite functions because it mixes continuous and discrete mathematics so beautifully. So our goal is to find all real numbers x such that the floor of x squared plus 1 over 10 plus the floor of 10 over x squared plus 1 equals 1. Let's really quick recall what the floor function does. So the floor of y, where y is any real number, is the greatest integer less than or equal to y. So you can think of the floor function as like an elevator down to the first integer that you would pass. So for instance, the floor of 1 half would be 0 because the greatest integer less than or equal to a half is 0. The floor of negative 3 and a half would be negative 4 because remember you need to go downstairs. The floor of pi is 3 and that's because pi is between 3 and 4. Okay, so now that we've recalled what the greatest integer function is, let's jump into solving our given equation. Maybe the first thing to notice is that we have a term here and it's reciprocal here. That gives us some major motivation that we should really set maybe a new variable equal to this object and then notice that the reciprocal of that new variable will be this term. And then we have a little bit easier of an equation to solve and use that to get a solution to our given equation. So in our case, I'm going to set our new variable y equal to x squared plus 1 over 10. And let's notice in this case, our equation becomes the following somewhat simpler equation of the floor of y plus the floor of 1 over y equals 1. Another thing that I'd like to point out is that we are no longer solving over all real numbers, and that's because this y object is always bigger than zero. In fact, it's always bigger than one over 10. So let's maybe note that real quick, that y is bigger than or equal to one over 10. That's because x squared is always bigger than or equal to zero for all real numbers x. Another important thing to note is that we can't have y bigger than or equal to 2. So why can't we have y bigger than or equal to 2? Well, that's because in that case, we would have the floor of y is bigger than or equal to 2. But then the floor of y plus the floor of 1 over y will be bigger than or equal to 2, and thus it cannot be equal to 1. So all of that boils down to the following setup. So we have y on the following interval. So it is bigger than or equal to 1 over 10, and it's strictly less than 2. So I'll write that as a half open interval. Then maybe to be a little bit more exact, we can't have y equal to 1 either. So why can't y be equal to 1? Well, notice if y is 1, then 1 over y is 1, and then the floor of each of those summed will be 2, which is not equal to 1. So let's point out y cannot be equal to 1. So we have really y is on the union of the following two intervals, 1 tenth to 1 union, 1 to 2. Next, we'll think about these two disjoint intervals as cases, and we'll look at these cases one at a time. So let's say case number one is that we have y on the interval 1 over 10 to 1. Okay, well notice if that is the case, then we know that the floor of y is equal to 0, but if the floor of y is equal to 0, that means the floor of 1 over y must be equal to 1. So let's write that down. The floor of 1 over y must be equal to 1. But in order for the floor of 1 over y to be equal to 1, we need 1 over y to be on the open interval from 1 to 2. So it can't be equal to 1 because of our previous discussion, but it can be anything all the way up to 2. Okay, but if 1 over y is on that open interval, 
that means y is in fact on the open interval one half to one, just by taking the reciprocal of all parts of that inequality. Okay, so let's see what we have. If y is in this interval one tenth to one, then in fact, y is on this somewhat smaller interval from one half to one. And in fact, y is allowed to be anything on that open interval because anything on that open interval will correspond to a one over y value to between one and two, which will floor to one, and that'll give us a solution. Okay, nice. So now let's maybe get rid of this and we'll look at our second case. Okay, so our, for our second case, we have y is on the open interval from one to two, but let's notice that means one over y is on the open interval from one half to one kind of in parallel to what we did before where y and one over y are playing reversed roles. But now let's notice that the floor of y in this case is equal to one, whereas the floor of one over y is equal to zero. But now if you sum those, you're always okay. So what that means is if we start with y on the interval from one to two, then in fact we get no further restriction. So in the end, we've seen that y is allowed to be anything between one and two, but on the interval from one tenth to one, it can in fact only be on the sub interval from one half to one. Okay, so let's summarize that at the top and then we'll keep going. So on the last board, via the substitution y equals x squared plus one over 10, we've determined that y must be on the interval one half to one union one to two. So in other words, this is like the open interval from one half to two where we have removed the number one. Okay, so now let's analyze these two cases. So first, when y is between one half and one, and second, when y is between one and two. What are we analyzing these for? Well, we're analyzing them for possible values of x, because let's recall our goal is to describe all numbers x satisfying this guy right here. So taking y on this open interval is the same thing as saying that y is strictly between one half and one which is the same thing as saying that x squared plus one over 10 is between one half and one. Okay, but then we can multiply all parts of this inequality by 10 and we'll see that this means that five is less than x squared plus one, which is less than 10, which tells us that x squared is between four and nine. But this is a little bit tricky taking the square root. We must not forget to think about the negative values of x. So taking the square root of all portions of this inequality, we'll split this into two separate inequalities. First off, x is between negative three and negative two. So notice if we take something between negative three and negative two and we square it, we will be between four and nine or x is between two and three. So let's maybe put an or between those, and that's what we have for this case. So now let's move on to the next case where y is between one and two. So that means that x squared plus one over 10 is between one and two or x squared plus one is between one and 20, or x squared is between nine and, let's see, that's gonna be 19. So now taking inspiration from what we did over here, when we take the square root, we have to expand this into two cases based on the positive and negative values of x. So first off, we can see that this means that x is between the negative square root of 19 and negative three, or three and the square root of 19. So those are the two cases that we get here. So this would be a suitable final solution, but what I'd like to do is write the whole thing in interval notation just so it's a little bit tidier. So let's erase this and then we'll finish it off by doing that. 
Up to this point, we've determined for x to satisfy the following equation involving the floor function and some quadratic polynomials. We see that x needs to be in the following intervals along the real number line. So it must be between negative root 19 and negative 3, negative 3, negative 2, 2, 3, or 3 root 19. But maybe this is most intuitively seen as the interval between negative 19 and negative 2 where we remove negative 3 or the interval from 2 to 19 where we remove positive 3. So using that visualization, we can write this as the union of some intervals. So we've got negative 19 up to negative 3 union, negative 3 up to negative 2, union, 2 up to 3, union, 3 up to root 19. And x being in this union of disjoint open intervals in the real line represents all possible x that satisfy this equation. And that's a good place to stop.